I have the pleasure, of course, of introducing Vince. I've known Vince for, for quite some time. I first heard of Vince when, when I was an undergraduate studying media studies. And a friend, an upperclassman, pressed this book onto my hand and said, you'll love this book. And it was called Contracting Colonialism. Um, I wasn't a historian yet at that time. Um, so he pressed the book onto my hand um, and I inhaled the book. And um, lucky for me, a month after, Vince was delivering a talk at the University of Santo Tomas. And so like an, under, like an enamored undergrad groupie, I drove all the way to Manila and watched his talk there. And I asked him a very undergraduate question, which is, how do you think about theory, Professor Rafael? And, and he said some, and I remember his answer. And he said that, you know, I think about theory as a way to bridge the conversations that are happening in the United States with the kind of historiography I'm very attached to in the Philippines. And, you know, that was a brilliant answer. And I think that that kind of crystallizes what Vince has been trying to do all these years, which is to bridge these various conversations in the United States and the Philippines, publishing both in the United States and in Philippine journals with Philippine publishers, publishing about topics that are relevant to um, Philippine historiography, but also relevant to ethnic studies here in the United States. And, and, and you know, since then, of course, I've, I've read much more of Vince's work. And we've become comrades in this new emerging field called Duterte studies. <laughs> so anyway, Vicente Rafael is the author of several works on the historical and cultural politics of, colo of the colonial and post-colonial Philippines, including the book that turned me into a historian, uh, um, Contracting Colonialism, Translation and Christian Conversion in Tagalog Society under Early Spanish Rule, Motherless Tongues, The Insurgency of Language Amid, war amid Wars of Translation, 2016, The Promise of the Forum, Nationalism and the Techniques of Translation in the Spanish Philippines and White Love and Other Events in Philippine History. Most of these books have been published both by Duke University Press and Ateneo de Manila University Press. He is the editor of Discrepant Histories, Translocal Essays in Filipino Cultures, Figures of Criminality in Indonesia, the Philippines and Colonial Viet Vietnam, and Nick Joaquin's collection of short stories, The Woman Who Had Two Navels and Tales of the Tropical Gothic. Currently is finishing a manuscript on politics and aesthetics, uh, on the politics and aesthetics of the Duterte regime called The Sovereign Trickster, Death and Laughter in the Age of Duterte, again to be published by Duke University Press. And, and I, I think Vince Ateneo Press as well, if I'm not mistaken. I hope so. <laughs> Hopefully. Okay. So let me turn over the floor to Professor Vicente Rafael. Yeah. Uh, Thank you, Liloy, for that very, very generous introduction. Um, I, I, I remember, I think it was back in 2017, we had that conference in Colombia that Sheila Coronel uh, uh, put together, and uh, you were introducing, with Nicole Coratoy, you were introducing your Duterte reader, and I still remember what you said. He said, from now on, there is no Philippine studies without Duterte studies. And so <laughs> I, I took you up on that, and, you know, years later, here's my, here's my own contribution to the field. Uh, thank you, Sarah and, and uh, Maxim and the, and the Center for Southeast Asian Studies at Berkeley for hosting this talk. I very much appreciate it, uh, especially since this material is still in process, and I look forward to people's uh, responses to it. Now, uh, and, and of course, thanks to everyone who I can't see, uh, who uh, signed in and who's attending, and I look forward uh, as well to, as much as possible, to interacting with you uh, during the uh, Q&A. Now, uh, I, as Lilo mentioned, this, this, this book is part, uh, this essay, right, or this talk I'm giving, is part of a, 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 a book that I'm trying to finish on the Tertis, uh, what I've been calling his authoritarian imaginary. Um, and it is prompted, among other things, by questions of his seemingly bulletproof popularity. Uh, his approval, approval ratings recently uh, were, were uh, seemed to be as high as 91%, uh, although this, this has been much debated by uh, various people. But it does indicate something of his ability, his popularity does indicate something of his ability to uh, monopolize uh, both material and symbolic resources for sustaining his authority. And today I wanna to focus not so much on the material side, but on the symbolic side uh, of those resources, uh, the symbolic aspects uh, of his governing style as a way of uh, understanding his uh, continued strength. Uh, and conversely, uh, the, the weakness of his opposition. Uh, now, uh, so to begin, uh, let me pose this question, you know, what are the sources of Duterte's 
uh, symbolic authority? Um, how has he managed to occupy uh, such a central place in the imaginative life of Filipinos, uh, both supporters and critics alike at home as well as abroad? Uh, one of the ways in which the president lays claim, as those of you who follow uh, these, these events closely, one of the ways uh, in which he, he lays claim to both national and global attention uh, is through his stories and jokes. Uh, Duterte is widely known for his irreverence and body humor, um, and uh, uh, con which constitute important elements of his governing style. Uh, he is given to uh, generously speaking uh, to, uh, he's given to generally sp sprinkling his speeches with cuss words uh, such as putang ina, son of a bitch, it can also be, which can also be translated into uh, motherfucker, fuck you, uh, often uh, accompanied by uh, a, a, a sort of, you know, the, the finger that, that he's been known to flash uh, directly at his critics. He also makes frequent references to genitalia, uh, his as well as those of his critics, uh, to the delight of his listeners. He revels in what Ashio Mbembe calls an aesthetic of vulgarity uh, that has the effect of establishing a relationship of conviviality between himself and his audience. Uh, what results, again, drawing from Mbembe is an intimate tyranny much of it centered on, tale, on the tales of his phallus as it encounters the world. And later on, I, I will clarify exactly what I mean by phallus uh, as, as we move along. So for example, here's an example. Uh, in one of his campaign events in April of 2016, uh, Duterte addressed the Makati Business Club, made up of some of the wealthiest businessmen in the country. But rather than talk about his economic policies, he regaled the predominantly uh, older male audiences with stories of using Viagra. This is what he says. Well, I'm separated from my wife, Anul, so I'm useless. Uh, so I'm not useless. I'm not paralyzed. What am I supposed to do with my goddamn thing down there? Let it, lo uh, let it hang forever? Well, there's no drama going on. I drank Viagra, and when it stood up, oh, let's not kid ourselves. I am giving it to you raw. I thought we were all the same age here. Uh, so, um, here Duterte shares with uh, men of a certain age and considerable influence. Uh, a story about his experience of emasculation followed by rejuvenation. Thanks to the pill, thanks to a pill, he regains his heart on uh, the material evidence of his phallic power uh, that he thought he had lost. Laughter ensues as he discursively shows to the men part of himself that should have been hidden. His obscenity consists of making the private public, reaching below to connect with those above. It is this sexual politics from below that binds Duterte to these men, along with the sprinkling of women who join the laughter. Together, they share a common fantasy about the authoritarian phallus as something they can imaginatively grasp and the prospective pleasures of a drug-induced erection, beginning with that of Duterte's. But as we shall see in other examples below, the presidential phallus comes across not only as an instrument of pleasure, but also as a sign of terror. In another campaign stop at a large sports complex in Quezon City, around the same time, Duterte tells a story that reverberated around the world. While he was a mayor of Davao in 1989, there occurred a bloody prison siege in Davao City. Among the dead was one of the hostages taken by the prisoners a 36-year-old Australian missionary named Jacqueline Hamill. According to Duterte, she was repeatedly raped by the prisoners along with other women hostages before being killed. But rather than evoke pathos, the sight of Hamill's cor corpse steers desire in the mayor. And let me just pull up the uh, next slide. All the women were raped so during the first assault, because they retreated, 
the bodies they used as shields, one of them was the corpse of uh, the Australian woman, lay missionary. This, this was a problem. When the bodies were, uh, <clears throat> uh, when the bodies were brought out, they were wrapped. I looked at her face, son of a bitch. She looked like a beautiful American actress. Son of a bitch, what a waste. What came to my mind was they raped her, they took turns. I was angry because she was raped, that's one thing, but she was so beautiful, the mayor should have gone first. Son of a bitch, what a waste. Hamel's rape and death is used by the Turk as a setup for a joke about himself, more specifically about the arousal and frustration of his lust. He sees her dead body and her beautiful face, uh, and he feels that he should have been the first in line to assault her. Instead, he comes too late and so isn't able to come at all. It is his failure to assert his claim on the woman's body that is presumably taken by his audience as the object of hilarity. Seeing her dead body fills him neither with rage nor grief, but with desire that cannot be fulfilled. Um, he is unable to discharge his authority, as it were. The horror of the scene is this displaced into a story about a mayor uh, lamenting the failure of his phallic power, rather than the erectile victory celebrated in the first story about Viagra. The second ends with a punchline, Sayang, what a pity, preceded by the cuss word, putang ina. But all is not lost. Duterte's disclosure of desire unfulfilled and phallic authority undercut produces a payback. The audience laughs and their laughter compensates him for his lost power. It returns, him both, uh, it returns to him both the pleasure and authority that dead prisoners and the woman's corpse had deprived him. Unable to pull his rank, Unable to pull rank, the mayor is nonetheless rewarded with people's recognition of his narrative performance. Reports of the story drew sharp rebukes from feminists, human rights advocates, the Australian and US embassies, and many other quarters. But among the, most of the electorate, his popularity soared, horrifying his critics, but delighting his supporters with this pungent shamelessness. Duterte's bad language and obscene stories were crucial in propelling him to the presidency. In, in tracking his jokes, we can see a set of obsessions built around the question, who gets to own the phallus? Who gets to wield it and for what purpose? Here, the phallus should be understood less as a biological thing, synonymous with the penis, as, a, as it is a symbolic weapon for asserting autocratic authority and patriarchal prerogatives over women and men alike, like guns, cars, or wealth. The phallus can be used to impress and to threaten, to unify and disperse, to induce pleasure, but also coerce submission. Duterte routinely threatens to castrate his opponents, even as he repeatedly re reveals his generous endowment. Using, uh, used to avenge imagined hurts and shore, up uh, and shore up a fragile ego, Duterte's phallus proved effective in shutting down his opposition. The presidential phallus, however, is far from being an unassailable force. As we saw in the rape story above, it can be blunted by other men and the woman whose death frustrated Duterte's assertion of his privileges. Indeed, Duterte is notorious for joking about rape as a way of reasserting his ability to police women's behavior and enlist men into affirming the sexism that buttresses his authoritarian imagination. Hence, when critics point out that contrary to his claims, crime in Davao while he was mayor has gone up, especially rape, he retorts that, whatever, that wherever there are beautiful women, there will be plenty of rape. Along the same lines, he also spoke approvingly of men who had caught the balls to rape candidates for Miss Universe in exchange for facing certain punishments. Women are raped not simply because they are women for Duterte, it is because they are beautiful. It is as if their beauty is a challenge that has to be faced down, a, pr a provocation 
that must be put in its proper place under the rule and in the service of the phallus. The philosopher Kate Mann uh, describes uh, misogyny in ways that uh, I think are very useful for understanding Duterte. She says, uh, and here again, let me uh, switch screens. She says, misogyny is what happens when women break ranks or roles and disrupt the patriarchal order. They tend to be perceived as uppity, unruly, out of line, or insubordinate. Misogyny isn't simply hateful. It imposes social costs on non-compliant women. Think of misogyny then as the law enforcement branch of the patriarchal order. This makes for a useful if rough contrast between misogyny and sexism, whereas misogyny upholds the social norms of patriarchies by patrolling and policing them, sexism serves to justify these norms, largely by an ideology of supposedly natural differences between men and women with respect to their talents, interests, proclivities, and appetites. Sexism is bookish, misogyny is combative, Sexism is complacent. Misogyny is anxious. Sexism has a theory. Misogyny wields a cudgel. In joking about rape, uh, Duterte upholds patriarchal norms and sexist attitudes by wielding the cudgel of misogyny. And that cudgel, of course, is the phallus, at once combative and anxious always wary of challenges and eager to assert itself. One particularly disturbing story that illustrates the law enforcement role of misogyny involves Duterte encouraging soldiers when confronted with communist female fighters to spare their lives, but to shoot them in the vagina. Uh, quote, there's a new order coming from the mayor, he told these soldiers. We won't kill you, we will just shoot your vagina so that if she has no vagina, she would be useless, close quote. Shooting them in their vagina was in a way taking away what made them women. It was the punishment for taking up arms and defying the state. It amounted to, quote, castrating those who challenged patriarchal norms, uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, patriarchal norms integral to the exercise of the state's authority. Hence, we see how Duterte's misogyny is directed not at every woman, uh, not at every woman, but at particular women who attempt to seize the phallus for themselves, daring to go against its political and sexual authority. One such woman who has felt the brunt of his wrath is of course, Senator Lila de Lima. Her original sin, as it were, <clears throat> was investigating Duterte while she was head of the Commission of Human Rights for killings he was alleged to have ordered in Davao while he was the mayor. Once elected to the Senate, uh, De Lima held hearings on the president's role in conducting extrajudicial killings that included testimonies of two former hitmen about their involvement in Duterte's Davao death squad. Furious at her, Furious at her for challenging his authority, he went about setting her up on charges of being involved in drug trafficking herself. By putting pressure on the Senate allies and the courts, he had her arrested and imprisoned in 2017. As of this writing, she has yet to have her case heard in court. Delima's punishment included her public humiliation. The president and his cabinet circulated salacious stories about her affair with her driver, claiming to have sex tapes of the two. The Lima's guilt is thus less about drug dealing, which the administration is hard pressed to prove, as it is about acting upon her desire. She not only defied the authority of the president, she also dared to transgress sexual and class lines in taking up with a member of the lower class. In other words, she disrupted the patriarchal and elite order of things, poaching upon traditional male entitlements. And for that, she had to be punished severely. Duterte and the rest of his male cabinet mercilessly ridiculed her, at one point offering to show the fake sex tapes to Pope Francis, who had sent to Lima a rosary in support. From Duterte's perspective, the Lima acted out of line, 
taking the power of the phallus for herself. He had to retaliate, holding her in prison without benefit of a trial, effectively silencing her. Now, the Turkish phallic power is directed, however, not just at women, but as we saw above, at other men to make sure that they too fall in line. For example, while campaigning for senatorial candidates during the midterm elections of 2018, Duterte extolled the size of his penis in order to set him apart from the ugly candidates running uh, in the opposition. While one's character is important, penis size, he claimed, was crucial. Had God given him a small penis, he continued, he would have gone to the church altar and cut it off saying, quote, son of a bitch, is this all you've given me? Encouraged by the crowd's laughter, he then recalled how he would walk around naked in the hallways of the YWCA as a young man. While everyone else covered up with a towel, he went about proudly displaying his junk. Uh, and uh, here's my next slide. The other residents, uh, so while everyone else covered up with a towel, he went about uh, proudly, proudly dis displaying his junk. The other residents would look on in admiration. They'd tell me, son of a bitch, Duterte, you're so hard. When I was young, my penis almost looked up to the sky, moving the microphone upwards to make the point. Its head would almost reach his belly button. I'm very thankful to my father. At least he let me out into this world highly equipped. He finishes by recalling how women at a local bordello were shot at the sight of his member. They ran away. We don't like him. That skinny guy, he won't stop having sex. In his youth, Duterte claims he literally stood out, creating a vivid impression among both men and women. While men envied his penis, uh, women, however, ran away in fright. Uh, wishing to have a phallus like his, the other men acknowledged Duterte's possession of this power precisely for the respect it arouses in other men and the fear of sexual violence it steers among women. Merging masculinity with misogyny, Duterte's phallocentric politics is central to his authoritarian imagination, using the image of his penis to put both men and women in their putative places. This brings to mind Helene Sixu's uh, uh, comment, quote, within the, fallow, within the fallocratic apparatus, women are subordinated and defined by a lack, while men are given the grotesque and unenviable fate of being reduced to a single idol with balls of clay, close quote. We can further see Duterte's fallocentric politics at work in the following example. In a speech in 2019, Duterte reacted to the rumors that he had had a kidney transplant and was dying from colon cancer. The target of his ire was Kit Tata, former cabinet minister during the Marcos regime and a major figure in the ultra-conservative Catholic sect Opus Dei. In his newspaper columns, Tata had written about Duterte's illnesses and frequent absences from public view, suggesting that he was on the verge of dying. Duterte responded by saying, uh, and here, let me get the next slide. This Tata, he said my day is coming, that I was confined, serious, in and out of the hospital with colon cancer. Nearly every day he was going on and on. You read the newspaper. I mean, how unfair can you get every day? Even I started to believe it. So one day, as I undressed to take a shower, I held my, without my underwear, I held my anus, I smelled it, smelled like shit, and not some other dot, dot, dot. He said I was already dead. So I hit back. I said, this tata, you tata, son of a bitch. I would admit it if I were sick. You, son of a bitch, you have a serious case for 30 years of diabetes. You, your dick can no longer raises the microphone to laughter and applause. When you have diabetes 30 years, it drops the microphone, laughter, no more. So I said, let me borrow your wife for one night. I'll let her hold my body. Go on, your insult hurt a lot. 
Okay, you son of a bitch, you're asking for it. You said I was rude. Well, son of a bitch, that's true. You said I was no statesman. Well, that's true. The president has always been particularly sensitive about rumors regarding his health, despite the fact that his various illnesses have been widely reported and takes particular umbrage at those who suggest that he is close to death's door. Duterte takes his revenge in the form of returning Tata's putative insults with interest. The, uh, Tata, uh, but he takes his time getting there. He recaps the rumor, acknowledging its power to compel belief through its repeated circulation. To make sure that he doesn't have colon cancer, he talks about poking around his anus and smelling his fingers, reassuring himself that it smelled of shit rather than some, some other cancerous odor. Discursively exposing his anus, he also exposes himself not only to the possibility of being sick, but also to the possibility of being duped. Assured that his anal stink is nothing out of the ordinary, he goes on the attack. Punctuating his remarks with crisp invectives, he points out that it is in fact Tata who has been ill with diabetes for many years, and as a result, can no longer get his dick up. The consummate performer that he is, Duterte makes a point of illustrating this with the use of the microphone as a prop. He lifts it up and down to show the contrast between what he can do with his penis and what Tata can no longer do with his. He goes from exploring his anus to scrutinizing his penis, linking the two as signs of his good health. And to clinch his case, he asks to borrow Tata's wife so she can verify the hardness of his erection as compared to the flaccidness of Tata's. His mouth and anus come to the aid of the presidential phallus. Together, they marshal a barrage of obscenities that meets with the laughter and applause of the audience. In this way, Duterte effectively unmans his opponent. Uh, Tata's stories uh, depicted Duterte in a state of bodily crisis. Feeling aggrieved, the president hits back, uh, showing that in fact he remains in command. Uh, beginning with his control of the narrative and his ability to reverse its target, returning the insult with interest, Duterte draws a third person into the scene, Tata's wife, who is pictured as complicit in the Turtis revenge, in effect, cuckolding her husband with uh, the invitation for her to grasp his thing. One second. Now, I have one last and, and perhaps most revealing instance of the Turtis power of storytelling uh, to round up uh, this talk. And that is, of course, uh, his very well-known story of being sexually abused at the age of 14 by an American Jesuit priest during confession. He often returns to the story as a way of casting aspersions at the Catholic Church, which had been crucial, which had been critical of his human rights abuses. Folded into the story, however, is another, his sexual abuse of their household help which he later confesses was actually a fabrication. Here, what we see is a double confession, the Duterte to the priest and to the audience, and a double assault, the priest on the Duterte and the Duterte on the maid. The two acts of violation turn out to be intimately related, whereby the priest's assault of the Duterte becomes a means for the latter's domination of his audience. He has frequently told the stories, this, these stories on various occasions, usually in a mix of Taglish, Bisaya, and English. Below is my translation of a composite version uh, that appears in various sources. And let me uh, get up the, uh, uh, the next set of slides. Now, in Ateneo, who is from Ateneo here? If you are from Ateneo on Friday, it's communion confession. That's automatic. And doing confession, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. And what is your sin? Uh, well, it's standing up because you're a founding my goddamn prick while confessing 
uh, the priests would fondle our balls. So when you confess, they ask you, what are your sins, my son? Uh, I was a fresh man. Uh, what's the sin of a fresh man? I, I, come on. I, 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 I is not a sin. We do not have the whole day. Speak up. I went to the, what? I went to the room of the maid. Why? I lifted the blanket and I tried to touch what was inside the panty and I was touching. She woke up. So I left the room. Where did you go after? To the bathroom. Why? Quan, father, yung the usual. Well, father, the usual. What is the usual? Alamo, you know. Okay, so you went back and I tried to insert my finger, father. Then I, I, there was hair and it was wet. And did she wake up? No, father, she was closing her eyes, fast asleep. Oh, sabi ng pare, the priest said. And I went to the bathroom again, father. Again? Yes, father, twice. Oh my God, say five Our Fathers and five Hail Marys because you will go to hell. That is the explanation behind the finger story. The priest would urge you to tell more sins. What sins could first, second, and third year students commit? Wolf whistling women was the only sin we committed. But Father Falvey, he was always urging you to tell him more sins. Come on, come, come on, give me your sins. Uh, do you know why? Because the longer you stay there, the more he can fondle your balls. And there were many priests. They would just divide the students among them. If you believe the story that I fingered the woman, you're crazy. I only said it because the priest was insistent that we tell him more sins so we would stay kneeling while he squeezed our balls. Son of a bitch, that's the truth. Many of the tortoise stories Many of the Turtles' stories are arguably confessional to the extent they are about exposing what usually stays hidden, bringing to light what otherwise remains in darkness. The subject who speaks is also the subject who is spoken about as he or she reveals the history of their sinful acts to a priest who in turn dispenses penance in the name of God. As the mediator of divine forgiveness, the priest exercises an inordinate power over the penitent, registering the penitent's debts and prescribing the penance uh, with which to cancel these. However, in the Turtas telling, uh, the very act of confession is subverted. It is no longer meant to seek forgiveness and acknowledge the priest's authority, but precisely to ridicule it. Duterte reveals the priest's concupiscence, showing how confession becomes a vehicle not for forgiveness, but for clerical abuse. Confession breeds obscenity rather than divine dispensation, making for an uncanny encounter between priest and penitent. What emerges in the experience of confession uh, for the penitent, here a young boy, uh, is the return of the repressed in familiar form, the predator as father. From the perspective of the boy, the father's demands appear autocratic. He cannot be refused. His lust for the boy requires that the latter must stay longer in the confessional, making up sins in order to satisfy the priest. To comply with the priest's demands, Duterte makes up a story about fingering their housemate, then masturbating in the bathroom. He evokes a circle of touching. While the priest fondles his genitals, Duterte talks about foisting himself on the genitals of the woman as she sleeps, then subsequently fondling himself. His story connects these improper connections into a sequence of submission and mastery that yields pleasure and laughter. The trauma of sexual abuse for Duterte at the hands of the priest is transmuted into the excitement of probing the maid's genitals, then mastering, as it were, his own. This mixture of fear, shame, and excitement is registered in Duterte's stuttering reply to the priest's insistence that, that he tell him more and more. I, 
I, I, he says, as the priest holding his balls fishes for more, demanding, and, then, and. Duterte's confession climaxes, as it were, with two trips to the bathroom to relieve himself. In the end, the priest waves him off with a few feckless prayers, assuring him of eternal damnation. Rather than a site for contrition and divine forgiveness, confession here is converted into a kind of pornographic machine for the reproduction of sadistic male pleasures. Duterte submits to clerical abuse, but turns that submission into a story about his mastery over the maid who remains innocent of her violation. His exposure and disempowerment by someone above him become the conditions for overpowering someone below him. He thus reverses his position from being abused to being an abuser, from a position of submission to one of domination, from one of fear to one of satisfaction and release. But always and only at the expense uh, of the, uh, but only at the expense and through the exploitation of a subordinate other. Well, what of his audience? Feminists, human rights advocates, the church hierarchy, and other critics uh, of Duterte reacted with anger. They decried his misogyny in making light of sexual abuse as consistent with his disregard for human rights. Others were scandalized by his indecency, his filthy language, his lack of delicadeza or civilized behavior. In other words, they read Duterte's obscenity in the way that he had meant it as an unremitting war on social conventions. Judging from the transcripts and the videos, however, those who were present at his speeches reacted differently. They applauded his stories and laughed at his jokes. Why? Freud once posed the question, when we laugh at jokes, what are we laughing at? Are we responding to the techniques of joke telling or the content of the joke or to both? It is never clear, he says, to the extent that jokes like dreams are fulfillments of the same wish to evade repression. The joke, he says, Freud says, will evade restrictions and open sources of pleasure that have become inaccessible. It will further bribe the hearer with its yield of pleasure into taking sides with us without very close investigation. Reason, critical judgment, suppression, these are our forces against which a joke fights in succession. The political significance of jokes, the fact that they go against the grain of the reasonable and the normal, would seem to make them valuable resources for the oppressed seeking to overthrow the weight of authority. Uh, the philosopher and literary critic Mikhail Batin further argues that medieval celebrations like the carnival and modern literary forms like the novel were sites for upending for the up for this upending of hierarchy through satire, disguise, and social inversions. The high is brought down low, and the low is elevated, especially parts of the body and its functions. Bribing his audience. Duterte is like a smuggler of illicit goods, promising forbidden pleasures and overturning repressive strictures. He says what you would have wanted to say, but could not. Their laughter could thus be read as a sign of their identification with Duterte's efforts to find a way out of a suffering at the hands of the priest with a tale about abusing the maid, who nonetheless remains unaware of her violation. <coughs> They delight in his resistance and his bumbling attempts at mastery that leads to some sort of self-recovery. Decades later, when he tells the story, he's no longer a boy, but the president of the country. Occupying the heights of power, he's capable of commanding attention wherever he goes and whatever he says. The Turtas' obscenities feel subversive, but subversion in this context is in the service of an autocratic end where laughter produces an intimacy between ruler and ruled. The vulgarity of his language positions him as a kind of rebel, inviting others to join, in, to join him in his assault on bourgeois sensibilities and norms. But it, but it comes with a condition that the audience must submit to his narrative. Only he can tell the stories and expect the laughter. The reverse is never possible, as no one, as far as I know, uh, jokes with Duterte in public. He expects no narrative reciprocity, 
no return with interest, but only a kind of passive acceptance of the surplus of stories it gives you. There is thus nothing democratic in the Turdes humor. Instead, he instead, the pleasure that the audience gets from his jokes is intrinsically linked to their willingness to participate in the imaginative violation of others, especially women. Whether he seeks revenge or release, the Turtas tales seek to assert his phallic power over his enemies while simultaneously subordinating and overpowering his audience. In looking at the narrative structure of his jokes, we see how it hinges not only on the classic technique of joke telling, those of condensation and displacement as in dreams. It is also productive of a hierarchy of listening, whereby Duterte as the teller monopolizes the time and the language of telling. As part of the audience, you have no choice but to wait for him, and he is always late, then listen to him take his time unspooling his tales. Unable to leave without drawing your, his ire, you remain a captive audience. Jokes then become a way of establishing his authority. He exposes himself, renders himself vulnerable, and risks dissolving his authority, but only to recover and then reassert his mastery over the scene of exposure. This dialectic of disclosure and domination allows him to forge a tyranny of intimacy extracting your consent, registered by your laughter. Humor is thus a means of playing out his anxiety while assuaging his fear. Vulgarity is stylized and obscenity performed to release the audience's inhibitions at defying conventions. But this defiance is bogus and deeply conservative since it, is always, uh, since it always comes with the price of submission to Duterte's authoritarian imagination. While laughter creates conviviality and community, it is always shadowed by violence and fear. Duterte recreates in every story something of the tone and texture of his primal scene, the dark confessional, where he, where he is held captive at the hands of the American priest. Indeed, his performative shamelessness today may be read as uh, the unfinished struggle to master his fear of the father predator as he attempts to take on the latter's power for himself. That is, he himself wants to be that father predator. It is precisely that same phallic power that he seeks to grasp and wield when he addresses those he considers critical of him, such as women and lesser men, and especially abject figures of criminality, like drug dealers and users. Rec recklessly cussing at them, he lusts after their deaths brooking neither dissent nor opposition. And, and, then, and, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Vince. And um, we've, we've got a lot of questions already, so let me jump straight, straight to it. Um, we have a question from, from Don Emerson. He asks, in the context of your topic, uh, ph phallocracy, are there parallels between Duterte and Trump? If not, why not, and if so, what implications for the political futures of both countries? I, I, I think there's certainly uh, lots of parallels uh, between, and earlier we were talking about Giuliani and the Borat film, right? And, and there's a way in which authoritarian power is always phallic, right? And, and so there's a, there's a certain kind of phallocentrism that animates uh, uh, the exercise of, uh, you know, what I've been calling the authoritarian uh, imagination, right? It's, it's, it's the scene uh, you know that that very interesting description of misogyny. It's it's a scene where where uh, uh, power requires uh, this kind of misogynistic power requires uh, the, uh, a certain kind of combativeness, uh, a certain kind of paranoia, uh, and a certain kind of readiness, uh, as it were, to cut down so to speak, to castrate, so to speak, one's opponents and to put, especially women, uh, in their place. I think that this is probably something that you can find uh, all over the place, uh, not just the Philippines, uh, you know, just, you know, I, I can imagine in many, many other places. Uh, so yeah. Uh, this is, uh, um, next, uh, next question from Michael Van. Are there other Philippines? Sorry, I'm, I'm rushing through this because there are a lot. Yeah, yeah. Are there other Filipino politicians who have a similar tone to Duterte's vulgarity or is he sui generis? 
Uh, you, you know, it, 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 it's very hard to tell. I'm almost sure that, that, that what he says, the way he talks, is probably very common uh, among Filipino politicians, but in private. Uh, some of them go public, uh, but Duterte is really the one who sort of honed this particular style uh, into a particular, into, into a, 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 a craft of governing. So it's not, just, it's not just about establishing conviviality. It's not just about sort of hanging out with the guys and over drinks and you know, establishing a certain kind of community. Uh, he, he's honed the style into a way of uh, uh, asserting his authority uh, and, and uh, exercising a certain kind of terror, right? I mean, this is, you might say, sexual terror. Uh, over his audience, uh, that, that then uh, he sort of uh, he uses to his benefit. So, so is he so generous? Uh, perhaps I think so. I mean, I, I can't imagine even Marcos, you know, who was of course he was pretty sexist and all that. I, I can't imagine him, you know, uttering these kinds of words and, and, and cusses and so forth. There's just not the same level of investment in sort of invective and obscenity on a very public general level. So, yeah. I, th I think that that's, a, that's what makes the turtle unique. Right. Um, there are two really, um, the question from Nine Beth Emlano and the question from Maria or to Oste, they're, they're similar. Um, what does this, what does, what does the, what does the acceptance of this humor say about, you know, the, the Filipino audience? Yeah, it, well, you know, that's, that, that's really, that's really interesting. It's really sort of like, you know, it goes to the question of well, why is the turtle popular? Right. I mean, it's the same thing with Trump. Like he lies, he uh, you know, he he's he's a real operator, and yet his supporters accept him and and, and take him for what he is. Um, I, I think in the case of Duterte, it's very complicated. I think it's a combination of, uh, uh, on the one hand, uh, fear, uh, and on the other hand, it's also sort of like this this idea that somehow uh, Duterte has suffered. Right, which is why the story about about being abused by the priest, I think, I think is so central in his oof, right, in his in his his whole sort of uh, uh, storytelling uh, performance. Uh, and uh, here's here's somebody who suffered, who was abused, and yet who managed to overcome that abuse by himself assuming the power of the abuser. Right, uh, and and I think that, uh, that for for audience, certain audience, and not just Filipino, I think this is true with lots and lots of other people. Uh, that brings with it uh, a certain kind of uh, uh, this, this image of strength, yeah? this image of someone who, you know, you, you're not going to fuck with this guy because he's going to fuck with you, right? I mean, it, to use, to, to be uh, sort of more direct. Uh, and, and I think that that has a certain attraction for some people, right? Because they want to be just like that. They want to be just like that person who was once fucked, but managed to get over it and now uh, can fuck others yeah? without him being. Uh, fuckable, as it were. So, yeah. Um, Margarita Garcia is perplexed that there hasn't been a stronger pushback from Pinoy women, and she asks: Is is Duterte as popular among women as men, or is this perception a function of distance and lack of media attention? Yeah. On her part, I think. Yeah. Yeah. No. No. I think. I think that's a great question. But there has been a lot of pushback. As far as I know, I mean, there's been, I mean, certainly uh, w w when, you when you look at uh, some of the feminists in the Philippines, uh, yeah, they, never, they never fail to sort of, uh, uh, sort of respond uh, to Duterte. Uh, I, I think the problem, though, is the nature of the pushback. The nature of the pushback tends to be sort of, um, uh, at least in my impression, tends to be moralizing. Uh, and so in that sense, it, it, it gets blunted by Duterte's uh, uh, sort of uh, responses, which precisely is, is, is uh, not just amoral, but, but sort of, you know, it, 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 uh, uh, it revels in, in a certain kind of immorality, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 and therefore, uh, it's, it's all about uh, puncturing and, 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 and doing away with, with these, kinds of, these kinds of norms. Uh, it, 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 what other alternatives there are, I, I'm, I'm not exactly sure, but, but it's, sort of, it's sort of like, how do you, how do you uh, uh, respond to somebody who uh, uh, basically, uh, he's basically speaking another language, mm -hmm. right? And so it's very difficult uh, to, to critique him. The only way that you, you can really piss him off uh, is if you, if you, you know, say things about his health 
or if you, uh, 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 as you know, uh, criticize him for his, uh, 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 for his human rights records, uh, all of the stuff, then, then he gets really pissed and then he responds with this kind of vulgarity and with this kind of obscenity. And in the face of that, what do you say? Right, because it, it's not he. He basically outmaneuvers you and makes any kind of sort of rational uh, exchange impossible. Um, this is a related question. Michael Obenyanta is asking if the appreciation of the humor is a way for Filipinos to subvert or undermine the Catholic Church. No doubt, no doubt. I mean, I think that's one of the what's one of the the the, the, the uh, 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 one of the strategies that Duterte uses is that he sees the Catholic Church as an upholder of certain kinds of uh, uh, traditional norms and, uh, and traditional morality uh, that undercuts, that threatens to undercut his authority, especially around questions of human rights. And by finding a way of, of, of uh, highlighting the immorality of priests, right? They're, they're, the fact that they are, you know, uh, themselves corrupt, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Uh, he, he, he deprives the church of that particular uh, armor as it were, that moral armor, uh, and uh, allows him to uh, basically uh, overcome uh, whatever criticisms the church may have in the same way that he's able to overcome the criticisms of feminists in the Philippines. Um, just a comment from uh, Glenn T.J. Harito is asking if he can ask his questions live. There's no way for me to do that, so I'm sorry. Please um, type your questions for Vince and we'll get to it. Um, in the meantime, this question from Clara. Hi, Clara. Clara Balaguer. Uh, wants to ask about the relationship between the phallus and, um, and its seductive intimacy with queerness or the queer? Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's, a, it's a great question and, and I wish I could, it, it, uh, I, I, I need to have something more specific. Yeah, there's a longer, the, the question's actually longer. So she says, Duterte has said that because he was abused by priests as a child and used to think he was bakla but got cured, has been openly supported by Geraldine Roman, the Philippines' first trans congresswoman, and scholars Jonathan Ong and Jason Cabanas have written about the purple collar workforce of queer and trans bodies that feed Duterte's architecture of network disinformation. Uh, two of his top two propagandists are gay, uh, are a gay man and a trans woman. Yeah, no, it, 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 that's a really that's a really important question. I need I need to think about that some more. But uh, I, I I do remember that during the campaigns in 2016, <clears throat> I think it was 2016, he did this fantastic interview with Vice Tenda, mm -hmm. um, where he went on and talked about how you know he was attracted to men, he thought he was gay, and you know he proceeded he, to, to flirt with Vice Tenda and back and forth and back and forth. And and I think. Um, uh, the, 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 it sort of it sort of seems to indicate his willingness to uh, think about the phallus as as uh, as something that is uh, 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 what, what do you call it that is uh, uh, detachable and reattachable. In other words, to think about it precisely as a playful, right? That you can share, that you can circulate, uh, but in the end, it comes back to him. Right, so it's kind of like you know, think about think about uh, uh, what is it the, the, the strap on, right? The strap on dildo, right? That you can you can take turns putting on, uh, giving in and putting on, uh, and and that's sort of the extent of I think that the, his queer politics, if you want to call it that. So he's willing to engage in the circulation of the phallus, but that in the end uh, it must come back to him, right? He's the one who decides who gets to keep it. Who gets to do what with it, and of course that's 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 of course him. So, um, for Martin Arn Arnaldo, how far back can we trace this phallic culture in the Philippines? Is there a link to our colonization? Oh, jeez, uh, yeah. yeah, it's hard to do. Uh, uh, I I would say it probably has pre-Hispanic roots, although I, I I hesitate to go all the way back there. Uh, certainly, uh, you know, colonial uh, uh, history. Uh, has something to do with that uh, nationalist history. I mean, if you look at all the nationalists, I mean, they were all, uh, I think with, without a doubt, they were all invested in a certain kind of patriarchal notion of, of the nation. Uh, and so all had a very, very sexist attitudes towards women and did not hesitate in wielding the cudgel as it were misogyny. I mean, you know, uh, you, you can see this in Rizal, you can see this in Antonio Luna, you can see this in Juan Luna, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not, I mean, I, I would say that this kind of sexual politics probably runs through uh, uh, nationalist politics uh, 
uh, as much as it does colonial politics. Yeah. So. Discussion is fun. The Duterte is not always lucid in public. Um, uh, by, from Ricky Ponzalan, by the way. It's true, he's not very lucid. He rambles. Um, his COVID-19 briefings, for instance, are meandering and often hard to follow. How do you explain his ability to simultaneously represent strength and weakness in this context? Yeah, yeah. I, it, that's a great question. I mean, I think the rambling uh, is not so much an indication of his mental incapacity. I think the rambling is integral to his rhetorical style in a sense that uh, he, he doesn't expect you to sort of follow a, a kind of strict narrative structure. You know, he's certainly not an Aristotelian in that sense, right? Uh, but I, I think the rambling has to do with, you know, uh, again, again, sort of playing with language, you know, a certain uh, allowing language to sort of sweep him uh, rather than, rather than uh, sort of assuming that uh, he's in control of every rhetorical gesture. So if from, from the outside, from those of us, some of us who are listening, he sounds silly, he sounds stupid, he sounds dumb. Uh, but it's a dumbness that has uh, sort of complicated effects. You know, for a lot of people, they figure, well, that's just him. It turns out to be endearing. For some people, so and that that's a really interesting question. Why is it that at some points his uh, rhetorical stylings, which will appear to be insipid and idiotic, uh, for some people, for other people, would come across as uh, you know just, oh, that's just him. It's, it's endearing. We, we like it. So uh, kind of like Trump, you know, Trump does that too. He says all kinds of stupid things, but his followers just sort of say, "Well, that's it. That's him being him." So you know, uh, I, I so, wanted to press yeah. you a little bit on this because. Yes, he does ramble, but sometimes he also shifts to a kind of post-war declamatory style. You know, he, okay. kind of, oh, he kind of orates like a mid-century politician. And in that sense, he's, he's very similar to somebody like Quezon or even to Ferdinand Marcos. And he speaks in a kind of taught mid-20th century English when he does this. Yeah, I, I think that's a good point. And I think that comes from his training as a lawyer, uh, among other things. Uh, perhaps, perhaps his background in Ateneo, but certainly his training as a lawyer and his experience in the courtroom, uh, which allows him, which, which you know, sort of uh, gives him the, the ability to be able to, to make these reasoned arguments the way you would when you're presenting a legal, a legal brief. So yeah, mm, yeah. Uh, it was his legal training that, that connects him to that tradition of rhetoric. Yeah. yeah, you know, I just want to say that he doesn't ramble all the time. Sometimes his no. English is actually very precise, um, and yeah. people should, should should pay attention to that too. Um, a question from Lila Shahani: It is ironic that last year Duterte signed the Safe Spaces uh, Safe Spaces Act, which prohibits sexual harassment in online and physical spaces. This expands the definition of perpetrators and spaces in the first anti-sexual harassment law of '95. The question is. What is the level of the implementation gap for prosecuting perpetrators when the president himself appears to be exempt? Well, you know, that's a great question because what it does show is the way in which Duterte always holds himself above the law, right? Duterte exists in a state of exception, right? He can sign as many laws as you want about sexual harassment, but uh, the understanding is that it, it, does, not, uh, it does not prevent him uh, from from uh, uh, surpassing these laws, from overcoming these laws, uh, and, and that that of course is a sign of his of his sovereignty. You know what, what I call sovereignty. So he, he's the one who decides on the exception. Right? So not surprising at all. Question from Jeline Avila: um, Should we also read the laughter response as a way to lighten the intimidation? Uh, I think it's both. Uh, the laughter is a, a kind of a relief from uh, being confronted with uh, an intimidating figure, uh, one who could kill you if they want to. Uh, and at the same time, it's also a kind of complicity. You know, it's, it's this, this willingness, uh, as it were, to uh, be part of this community uh, of, of, of uh, fear, this community of, 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 of power. Uh, and, and, and so uh, it, it's both about, you know, it's, it's, like, it's like when you're, if you've, ever, if you've ever hung out with murderers and criminals, you know, and they joke, and you figure, oh, I better laugh because if I don't, I don't know what's going to happen. And then the other side of it is, oh, isn't this so cool? I'm with these killers and I like, you know, I, I can hang with them and it's okay, right? So it, it, it goes both ways and it taps into precisely uh, that desire to identify with those who's, uh, who, ha who, who, who can claim uh, to, uh, to take exception to the law, right? So, um, 
from Kathy Choi. Um, hi, Kathy. To what extent has his use of vulgarity changed from his days as mayor to now as president? Um, has it increased in intensity or is it similar or different? Yeah, I, it, it's hard to say, but you know, from, from anecdotal evidence, that is to say, from talking with people who knew him while he was mayor, uh, they basically said that, that uh, uh, he used to do all this kind of stuff. You know, he would meet you at that bar, you know, that famous bar he hang out, he would hang out in, in Davao, and he would, you know, out of nowhere, he would say, you know, I've killed a lot of people. Right, uh, it, both to impress you, to intimidate you, and to attract you uh, at the same time. You know, uh, so so uh, it, whether or not it's increased or not increased, I'm not sure. But that he's always used that same strategy. Uh, and there's also, I mean, there's also this sense that he's nationalizing the dirtiness of local politics. Yeah, yeah. Because definitely. these are, you know, a lot of the things he says. These these are said by people who campaign for mayor in the provinces, they're said by people who campaign for counselor, but it's never before been said by somebody who was campaigning for president. So I think that's part of why it's so shocking because it's a nationalization of a kind of perversion that's always existed in the margins of Philippine politics. That's right, that's right. Not only is it a, is it a nationalization, but also uh, an attempt to sort of uh, dissociate himself mm -hmm. with uh, sort of an international sort of, you know, moral order, if you yeah. will. Right. I mean, this is something that you can never imagine Marcos saying, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. out in public, because it would reflect and, you know, he would be, he would always be very afraid of sort of the image that he would mm -hmm. create uh, in the international community. And of course, Duterte, as we know, uh, it doesn't, you know, doesn't care much about the international mm -hmm. community. So. From Memen Loazon, is there any example in the world that we can draw from as a lesson for a more effective way of pushing back against this kind of authoritarian vulgarity? Uh, that's a really tough question. You know, my, my first impulse is to say, you can storm the palace and hang him by his ankles, but you know, it's not gonna happen. It's not gonna happen in the near future. <laughs> Uh, you know, because I mean, what do you do when you're confronted with that kind of authoritarian vulgarity mm -hmm. uh, in, in a situation where, you know, rational arguments and debates uh, won't work? Uh, you, you, you know, I, I, I'm not sure. I don't know how to answer that question. That is indeed tough. Um, from Glenn T.J. Harito, if Duterte is a symptom of our ill politics, how can hysterics benefit from studying Duterte? Sorry. Um, not sure okay. if I'm clear with that with the phrasing of that question. Perhaps it can be. Perhaps you can rephrase it, or you can attempt to answer it, Vince. It sounds, it sounds like a psychoanalytic question. Yeah. I, I, don't know. I don't know. I'm not a psychoanalyst. So. Okay. Um, Glenn, perhaps you can rephrase the question because I'm I'm not sure I, I I grasp it as well. Um, James Pangilinan, how does Duterte's outsider vulgarity via the vernacular efficacy of the joke present peculiar symbolic challenges for the opposition? Nice. Do leftists or Lenny, the vice president, Leonor Robredo, need to up their joke game? What might your analysis suggest for oppositional practice? I'm not sure if you know Lenny Robredo would work well through humor, but anyway, let's let's allow Vince to answer the question. Yeah, no, I mean, it, I, you're absolutely right. It's it's, you, it's not about it's not about uh, becoming it's not about matching his vulgarity. It's not about matching his obscenity. You know, it's about finding some other. Uh, discursive apparatus, you know, to combat him. Right now, uh, as far as I can tell, uh, the sort of the sort of uh, uh, what's what's ready to hand, what's ready at hand for the opposition is precisely a kind of two things. One is to to resort to uh, moral critique, right? Uh, it, it, it sort of you know assertions of what's proper, or what's correct, uh, etc. And then and to resort to the law, uh, legal uh, sort of uh, ways of of, of uh, undercutting and controlling him. But given the fact that he has so much control of the legislature, of the Supreme Court, uh, uh, and, and so forth, a kind of legal opposition to Duterte is, as it were, extremely difficult. Another, another way in which resistance was offered is through, is through international communities. Uh, trying to get the ICC and the Human Rights uh, Commission and so forth uh, to critique him. But recent developments have shown that that's not going to work either. 
right? So, mm -hmm. so uh, th there are very few options as far as I'm concerned and, and very weak sources, very weak sources of opposition. And I think that that, that itself deserves uh, some attention. It's like, why this weakness? What is the history of this weakness of opposition? And is there a way out of it? You know, so, I think so, that, so Vince, you haven't found an example of rhetorically potent humor coming out of the opposition? <laughs> Uh, not, not in a way that Duterte uh, readily deals with. Mm -hmm. you know, he'll, he'll, he'll cut him down very, very quickly. I mean, the, the Tata example uh, is a very good one. Uh, and then what he did to, you know, people like Chel Jokno and so forth, you know, he, he comes up with these, these critiques of Duterte's mm -hmm. human rights. Duterte comes back and he says, hey, you know, you're ugly and I've got a bigger dick. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. in the face of that, what are you going to say, right? This is, a, this is an important question, um, uh, again, from Maria or, or Toeste. There have been several protests in the Philippines, including um, the one during the State of the Nation address. Is there any indication that Duterte's narrative is wearing thin, considering the mistakes in response to COVID-19? That could be. That could be. Uh, and, and maybe a more fine-grained uh, sort of investigation of people's responses to Duterte's covid uh, uh, programs that show that, uh, but but it, it's very difficult to say because I mean you know if if like the Pulse Asia survey you know places a 91% approval rating it's ridiculous right I mean of course there are many reasons why he might score that high uh, that people have suggested but uh, at this point it, it's hard to say that that uh, if, if anything right now uh, is working. You know, I, I mean, working in a sense of, of limiting his power, of, of reining him in, uh, of offering alternatives. Uh, I, you know, I just, it, I don't know. I mean, call me pessimistic. I just don't see it happening. Okay, since I, I promised him I'd get back to his questions, um, Glenn T.J. Harito, paano po makiki, I'll translate, paano po tayo may kinabang sa analysis ni Sir Rafael kung hindi natin mapapanalo ang laban kay Duterte ngayon? So he's saying, how can we benefit from this analysis if we don't win the, the struggle or the fight against Duterte today? Uh, you know, the, the, it, it, it's, it's about, it's, about uh, it, it's, a, it's a different project, right? I mean, my project is diagnostic. It's not prescriptive. I'm not here to say, uh, it, it, this is what we know about the Duterte and therefore this will lead us to a way, to a program to oppose him. You know, my project is simply to say, where are we now? How did we get here? Why is he so powerful, right? And to put those not as, uh, and to provide not definitive answers, right? But to simply uh, uh, sort of point to certain symptoms. Uh, historically produced, materially grounded symptoms that makes him the way he is. Uh, and, and at this point, uh, as I said, I, 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 I don't know. Uh, I don't know if there is in fact a way of, uh, I, I, I have nothing to offer in terms, in other words, I have nothing to offer in terms of a kind of straight on tactic for resistance. Uh, but only to suggest uh, different avenues for understanding uh, what's going on, including why it is that we are such at pains to offer any other alternatives at the moment, right? Unlike the United States, for example, I mean, the United States, clear, clear uh, uh, sort of options to Trump right now as, as, as we, we move towards the elections, right? Uh, programs, parties, movements, and so forth. Uh, in the Philippines, uh, there are those things, but uh, somehow they don't, they're not at the point of coalescing. They're not at the point of coming together. Uh, so even when Duterte is gone in 2022, there will still be Dutartismo. There will still be his followers. There will still be the sort of same patterns of uh, authoritarian uh, uh, governance that will still remain. And what will replace those? It's hard to tell. There's a comment from Nila Shahani. Um, this is about the earlier discussions. She says that uh, government agencies like the PH Philippine Commission on Women have remained silent in the face of Duterte's language. And so this is a critical part of the problem as well. Um, so that's a comment. Um, there's another question. Um, from Memen Luazon, do you think Duterte will be more sensitive if the Visayan, the Visaya people themselves voiced out their disgust? Their, their disgust? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, and and what, what, what kind of, they would be disgusted at his disgusting behavior, right? So it's just like, oh, I'm disgusted 
that you're so disgusting. Mm. And he could probably say, well, I'll tell you what, I'll be even more disgusting. Mm. Mm. <laughs> yeah. So it, it's like, it, you, you're, you're, you're always rhetorically outmaneuvered with the mm. term. Okay, there's a question again from Ricky Punzalan. Um, is this vulgarity charisma? Ah, great question. I, I, I think that there, there's probably a very close correlation uh, between vulgarity and charisma, right? Because, you know, vulgarity is all about, uh, among other things, uh, uh, a certain kind of violence. Right? It's always about violence. Uh, it, 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 it's about the disregard of, you know, what we can think of as civility, right? Uh, and for someone to come and say, I don't care about being civilized, uh, is precisely someone who is, you know, at least in, in, in one other way of thinking about someone like that is to think of them as a barbarian. Now, barbarians are interesting, you know. Uh, barbarians historically uh, are very different from savages. Now, savages, as the name savage suggests, uh, salvaticus, you know, they, they're from the forest, uh, they live without laws, it's, uh, that's, that's the myth, you know, that's, that's the myth that you get from, from like, I don't know, from, from, from uh, these different political theorists. Yeah. The barbarian is somebody who uh, it, it, it rises up from the city and dedicates his entire life uh, to destroy civilization. Right, uh, so barbarian and barbarians and civilizations sort of grow up together, and the whole life of the barbarian is precisely uh, to destroy the city. Now, why would the barbarian want to destroy the city? Because the city enforces norms that limit his freedom. Well, what, what, why, why would it limit his freedom? Because for the barbarian, freedom means something very specific. Freedom for him is not a kind of social sort of comity that allows people to live together. For the barbarian. Freedom is more than anything else, the freedom to take away your freedom. I am only free if I can take away your freedom, right? Uh, and uh, anything that limits my ability to exercise my absolute freedom, my absolute sovereignty to take exception, right, is something that I'm gonna try and fight against. This is Duterte, this is exactly what Duterte is. Uh, his vulgarity is precisely uh, an expression of his barbarian freedom. From Maria again, um, on the father image, uh, recently Velasco and Cayetano, these are the two congressmen yeah. in the lower house, um, yeah. they're fighting over the speakership um, yeah. and Duterte apparently arranged a power sharing agreement with them. Um, yeah. There was a photo op where he was presented as being a father figure, bringing the family together, so kind of mediating. In addition, he has anointed his daughter as his heir apparent. Yeah. Is this the other side of the father predator or does this demonstrate how he is dominant over other men and directs women, his daughter? Well, it, it, it's, it's the patriarch as patron, right? So you have the patriarch as pe predator, but you also have the patriarch as patron, right? There's two sides of the same coin, right? And the patron is one who dispenses gifts, who enforces order, who maintains hierarchy, right? Who makes sure that the children get along and the mother knows her place, right? And this is the kind of, sort of patriarchal politics uh, that Duterte uh, plays out. Now, make no mistake, this is not just Duterte. I mean, this is very common in all Filipino, a lot of Filipino families. Uh, in fact, I'm in the middle of reading a really fantastic uh, uh, manuscript right now, and it's, it's an it's a ethnography of uh, uh, slums, Manila slums during the drug war. Uh, and, and it's very interesting how uh, the, the ethnographer, the authors, uh, show the existence of what they call uh, the patriarchy of the streets. It's the patriarchy of the streets, patron, but also predator, um, <clears throat> that sets the condition, that sets the condition uh, for things like Operation Tokong, you know, the drug war and so forth to, to happen. So, mm -hmm. so patriarchy uh, is absolutely uh, uh, sort of necessary, uh, both for uh, establishing a kind of sexualized order but also uh, for, for threatening uh, those who go against this order. Mm -hmm. There's a comment from Patricia Serenas, which I, I'll actually turn into a question. He, she says, you know, he, he gets away with it because he's been g getting away with it for a very long time as mayor. And mm -hmm. so I guess the question, if I were to turn it into a question, right, um, is he effectively just continuing his reign as mayor and you know how meaningful is that term because i remember you know i remember um i had a friend she was hosting a, a wedding and duterte was a guest in the wedding and she got an official note 
from the palace and it said, when you introduce the president, you have to introduce him as ang mayor ng Pilipinas, President Rodrigo Duterte. So the mayor of the Philippines, President Rodrigo Duterte. So I wonder if you can comment on that a little bit, you know. Um, yeah. Uh, but I mean, obviously, he's very he's very attached to this notion of being a mayor because you know that is that sort of like you might say uh, that, that's that's uh, that, that's where he's most comfortable in. You know, it's it's this it, for him power. It, there's there's an aspect of power that's always uh, sort of irreducibly provincial, right? So the provincialization of power uh, uh, sort of again uh, allows him to be able to to do things uh, to to uh, evade norms and to evade laws uh, that he probably couldn't if he acknowledged himself to be a national leader. So, so the provincial becomes a way of uh, sort of asserting uh, the locality of his power. And it's a locality uh, that, 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 that um, uh, uh, provides him with an excuse, as it were, mm -hmm. you know, uh, not, not, not to follow uh, all these other laws uh, that mm -hmm. are there. So, uh, but, but, you know, it, that, that's not a great answer. I, I need to go back and rethink this, actually, the, the whole relationship between the provincial and the national, uh, between the local and, 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 and the global, uh, in, in, in the case of the third. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. You know, may, maybe we could come back to that. I, mm. let, I'll, I'll think, I'll rethink it. I'll rethink that answer. Mm, and I mean, there's this entire literature about local politicians being caciques, and then there's a big debate in Philippine studies about whether or not that's a kind of Orientalist trope and whether or not we should regard Duterte as a cacique or something more than that. I mean, it's an interesting conversation to be had. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Um, a couple of comments here from Maria. Oi, we are screwed. Uh, and then from Lila, it's obvious that there is repeated persecution of women in this administration, but please note class differentials here beyond verbal abuse. It is predominantly poor women who get incarcerated. This expands the war on the poor we observe in the drug war. Um, and then there's this, I mean, you kind of and try to answer this, um, and we can. It's hard to answer this question, but Maria is asking, what would be a, wi a, a winning narrative against Duterte? Um, I wish I knew. I wish I knew, you know. But a, a, at the moment, uh, the, the, the sort of overwhelming popularity enjoys uh, the uh, the massive amounts of of uh, sort of power he's able to exercise uh, on all levels, right? In local, national, whatever. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. It's just, it's the, moral, the, the moral narrative doesn't work, right? Uh, the feminist narrative comes short. Uh, internationalist opposition, the international narrative doesn't seem to, to have any effect. Uh, you know, certainly the, the communist narrative doesn't have any effect either. Uh, uh, I don't know. I, I'm really at a loss. Mm. Um, I wish somebody could tell me. Yeah, so, I, so am I, you know. I, I mean, we've tried, we've really tried everything. You know, the opposition has tried everything. The guy is really, you know, he's Teflon. Um, from Tina, Tina Kuyugan, hi Tina. Um, given Duterte's outsized public persona and the way he electrified and rallied the Philippine electorate through his particular use of power, while retaining massive popular support to this day, what kind of president do you think will be elected in the next election, uh, Duterte II, Duterte Light, the exact opposite? Uh, you know, so, of course, a lot of people are getting their hopes on Lenny, right? How Lenny could be the return of a certain kind of order, uh, a certain kind of rationality, uh, you know, sort of uh, a, 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 kind of, a kind of rational governance, yoke to compassion, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. Uh, but but I, I'm not sure. I mean, it depends on the conditions. Depends on the conditions of that. I mean, we'll see what happens in 2022. You know, what are the conditions that are occurring? Uh, you know, for for example, when 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 Pinoy ran for office, uh, a lot of that arguably was because his mother died, right? And that generated a lot of a lot of compassion. Nobody expected that to happen. Everybody thought it was going to be Mara Ross, right? So a, a lot of the stuff is very contingent. Uh, it's, it's very hard to, to predict 
uh, well, who, who's going to come up next? It, but, but in the meantime, it's a lot of fun to look at the speculation, you know? Like, for example, what happened to Bongo? All of a sudden, Bongo is out of the picture with all the stuff that he was going to be, you know, next in line. Uh, it, now there's talk of Sarah Duterte with Bongo Marcos. Now there's, you know, it, Manny Pacquiao, you know, could probably win. You know, mm -hmm. Lenny Robredo teaming up with Tito, you know, yeah. Tito Soto, all people. Yeah. On and on and on and on. So what that does, though, is it reduces our, uh, it, it reduces political discourse. It mm -hmm. eviscerates mm -hmm. political discussion into these sort of speculative scenarios that are, you know, really no more than gossip. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the end, the third that comes out ahead mm -hmm. because we have nothing to offer in exchange. Yeah. Speaking of succession, I have a question. How comparable is Duterte's relationship with Sarah to Trump's relationship with Ivanka? Oh, it's hard to say. It's hard to say. I mean, clearly, uh, yeah, th th this goes back to the question of misogyny, right? Uh, misogyny is not about hating all women. It's about hating certain women. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, uh, being invested uh, in, 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 in the sort of the care that other women can give him. I mean, Duterte has always had this very, very interesting relationship, vexed relationship with his mother, and now with Sarah, because she, you know, he sees Sarah as this, as this formidable, formidable figure and, and possible successor, given the fact that, that his sons uh, uh, obviously don't, don't uh, make the cut. Uh, so uh, yeah, if there is going to be a successor, it'll, it, 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 no doubt it'll probably be Sarah. Uh, in the case of Trump, Trump, of course, has, has talk, talked up Ivanka as a possible successor. But I mean, given the nature of, of American politics, uh, that, that's 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 nothing short of risible. I mean, it's it's met with ridicule, and 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 and, and obviously, uh, I, some U.S. institutions still work so that if Ivanka were to run, she would have all kinds of you know legal cases up the wazoo. Sort of, you know. Yeah, but I mean, I sorry, my my question was like you know. Trump sexualizes Ivanka in a way that Duterte doesn't sexualize um, Sarah. Of course, they're both, they both seem yeah. to be in awe of their daughters, though. That's, yeah. that's the interesting yeah. thing. Yeah, um, yeah. What, what's interesting, what's very telling, though, is there was a time when Sarah, you know, sort of made public the fact that she was raped. Hmm. And Duterte said, you know, oh, yeah. waved it aside and said, oh, she's just, just a drama queen. Yeah, she's a drama queen, right? I remember. Right. Yeah. So, so, so I, you know, it's highly ambivalent. There's no question. Hmm. Very ambivalent. Yeah. Okay. okay, I saved this question um, for, for the last. It's another question from Clara because this is a nice kind of conclusion um, for your talk. Could you give us a brief summary of how you are circling around the idea of Duterte as a political trickster in your upcoming work? Uh, well, you know, the title of the book is Sovereign Trickster, right? So it combines these two categories. The sovereign, uh, that is the, the, the king, Right, the absolute ruler, the authoritarian, and then trickster, the trickster figure, who is, uh, as as we saw in this paper, uh, constantly uh, sort of making fun, uh, you know, uh, making these subversive gestures, uh, a figure of excess, uh, of of uh, uncontrolled desire, uh, uh, sexual as well as you know material desire, etc. Uh, etc. Et so sort of combining this uh, and and sort of thinking about a way to, to talk about Duterte, uh, not just simply as a populist or as an authoritarian figure and so forth, but as this figure who is at once uh, typical, but at the same time excessive, uh, who comes out of a particular tradition of Philippine politics, a very recognizable figure of Philippine politics, but on the other hand, uh, brings with him uh, a, a certain kind of shamelessness, right? Which, which itself is very curious because as we know, shame, hiya, is such an important uh, value uh, in Philippine civility, and for him to be able to dispense with that and and achieve the kind of power he has, uh, for me is, is is sort of you know really quite remarkable. And, and and finally, to ask how this combination of sovereignty and tricksterism uh, feeds into uh, his signature drug war on the one hand, uh, and 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 again the the inability of, of opposition parties uh, to sort of uh, mount a, a convincing uh, response to him. So so that's sort of like the, the general the general direction of the book. Uh, and as I said, let me emphasize the book is, is above all diagnostic. It is not prescriptive. It does not lay out a program. It simply sort of uh, it analyzes a set of symptoms, right? Mm -hmm. And asks how we got, how we got to where we got. So.
I'll squeeze in one last question from Karina Evangelista. Um, this is a good one. When we confer potency to the phallic vulgarity of Duterte and weakness to the decency of Lenny, in quotes, are we not validating the power of the Tatay figure to continue to wield uh, collective cudgel against not just against not just against women, but also against the the, the inang bayan or the mother country? No doubt, no doubt, right. So in that sense, when we invest in that patriarchal power, we become complicit in it. Uh, <clears throat> and then the question is, well, how do you post patriarchy? Yeah, it's like this large. How do you post patriarchy? Right? What are the basis, what are the resources, what are the tactics for uh, opposing patriarchy and for uh, 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 sort of getting rid of uh, the, kind of, the kind of phallic power uh, that pa patriarchy exercises. I mean, I mean I, of course, different people have different responses to this, you know, form, form different alternative communities uh, to, uh, you know, do away, uh, maybe the state itself, you know, the state itself is, is the harbinger, the, 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 the sort of, the sort of uh, that which conserves and perpetuates this patriarchal power. Can you imagine a non-patriarchal state, right? So, I mean, it, 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 it's, it's such a complicated uh, answer, I mean, a complicated question. And, and uh, you know, again, it, I, I, I'm not capable of answering that right now. All right. Um, sorry, there are two new questions. So um, I'll squeeze in these last two, promise, um, and we might go over time by around two yeah. minutes. Um, from Peter Zenoman, um, in, in the idea of power in Javanese culture, your dissertation advisor, Ben Anderson, links Sukarno's success as a politician to, link, to links between elements of his political style and deep structures in local political culture. Could a similar analysis be done for Duterte? And I'll also just add this other question from Rachel Reyes. Why has vulgarity proven to be an effective and winning political strategy in the Philippines? And then we'll end after that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, to, to, uh, I, I think to Peter's question, I, I, I think I, I, I try, to, I try to, to uh, flesh out that question of, you know, sort of what, what Ben was doing in the, in the, in the notion of, of Japanese power, indigenous sources for understanding Javanese power. I, I tried to flesh that out through, through the figure of the trickster figure, right? The trickster figure, which is, which is uh, sort of uh, uh, longstanding, uh, widespread all over the archipelago. Uh, I, I guess you could point to the trickster as a kind of indigenous source for understanding the potency uh, of, of Duterte's excessiveness, right? Uh, and, and so that's, that's what I'm doing. Uh, in connection with, with, with Ben Anderson, you know, Ben Anderson also has this fantastic uh, essay, which is the other side, uh, on the Sula Kachalogo, which, which is like a, a, a Japanese epic. I, I think it's 18th, 18th or 17th century uh, Japanese epic, uh, which narrates the story of a gigantic phallus as it goes from one village to another, right? Teaching uh, a village youth uh, the arts of sodomy. Right? And in this sense, you have a, a different kind of different envisioning of valid power, uh, which is about generosity, it's about sharing, which is about pleasure and not about domination. Right? And, and of course, it's possible because that phallus is not attached to any particular person. It circulates. Right? It's like that circulating phallus that I was talking about earlier. Uh, with regard to the second question of, of uh, 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 Rachel, about what was it, the, the vulgar, how to, how is, what is it again? Vulgarity. Uh, what was that second question of, of, of Rachel Reyes? Uh, why does vulgarity, so, oh, wait, let me. Uh, why has vulgarity proven to be effective? Why has vulgarity proven to be effective? I suspect it's because, well, first of all, I think it's important to see vulgarity not as something novel, but as something that's always there. It's something that, 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 that comes from different sources, right? Uh, it rises from below. Uh, among, say, uh, a sort of uh, 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 proletarian uh, lumpen communities. Uh, it, 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 you see it in the military, you see it in various institutions. Uh, it, 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 vulgarity is, you know, is, is precisely a way of, I mean, it's like joking. It's, it's a way of establishing uh, a certain kind of community. If you will, imagine, because we're talking about that Anderson, it's a way of imagining community, right? Imagining community based on one's ability uh, to be able to, uh, say, break norms, uh, to be able to expose oneself and at the same time master the terms of that exposure, you know, the way the way Duterte talks about his, his penis, for example, he exposes himself, but at the same time, he makes sure that he is the master 
of the terms of that exposure. Uh, and in, in that sense, it becomes very competitive. I mean, there are aspects of vulgarity, especially when you're sitting around drinking with men and so forth. There are aspects of vulgarity that are extremely competitive, right? Oh yeah, you think you've done this, well, I've done worse, and you're blah, 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 blah. Uh, and, and, and in that sense, uh, uh, you, you, have, you have a way of uh, forging a kind of community that is uh, sort of uh, that is uh, that feels subversive. It feels resistant. It feels uh, it feels uh, sort of uh, um, uh, uh, something that's 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 uh, uh, unusual and excessive. Again, the realm of tricksterism, as it were. Right. Uh, so so it's not it's not so much a vulgarity is something novel. It's always been there. And and someone like Duterte comes in and taps it. Uh, very cannily, very canny, canny use of vulgarity uh, as a way of tapping into what you might think of as uh, the national unconscious. All right. Thank you very much, Professor Vince Ravel. Marami salamat. And thank you, everyone, for attending this talk. Thanks, Liloy. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.